my name is Eric Huntington. I'm a TT and WF Chow Assistant Professor in the Department of Transnational Asian Studies at Rice University. Um, and I'm co-hosting this series along with my colleague, Professor Susan Huang, who's also in the same department at Rice University. Um, and this series is actually organized as a joint project between our Department of Transnational Asian Studies and the Dunhuang Foundation. Um, and so we want to express our sincere thanks to the Dunhuang Foundation for the wonderful opportunity to collaborate on these events. And or, or we're very excited to have this opportunity to highlight the theme of transnationality in Asia. Um, thanks to all of you who are joining us uh, online today from wherever you are in the world and whatever time zone you may be in. Um, I'll keep my introduction brief, but before we get started, I should mention that we will be using the Q&A feature of Zoom to address audience questions at the end of the lecture. So please do not type your questions in the chat, but use the Q&A function, uh, type your questions there, and I'll be able to um, read them to our speaker. Uh, the lecture will last about an hour and we'll have about a half an hour for questions and answers at the end. And now let me introduce our speaker to, uh, for today. Uh, Dr. Isabel Charlotte is the Director of Researches at the National Center for Scientific Research in Paris, France. Her research interests focus on Mongolian material culture and religion. Uh, and in this regard, uh, I can say that she's written many groundbreaking publications on uh, especially transnational topics, including questions of pilgrimage, uh, cultic relationships between Nepal, Tibet, and Mongolia, and the replication of distant architecture and images. Among her significant works are also the impressive monographs, Nomads on Pilgrimage, Mongols on Wutai Shan, uh, 1800 to 1940, uh, published with Brill in 2015, and Temples and Monasteries of Interior Mongolia, uh, published in 2006. I'm sure we're in for a great uh, talk today, so I'm just gonna turn things over to her. Uh, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Shalo. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, and thank you, uh, Suzanne, uh, for inviting me. Uh, I speak in the Dunhuang uh, Conference Series, Dunhuang Foundation Conference Series. So let me share my screen. Can you can you see the screen? It's okay. It's fine. Yes. Good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> so to introduce my my, uh, let me say a few words on the the context, uh, the general context. Uh, five years ago. Um, I started, oh, excuse me, it's apparently there's a problem. My, oh, okay. Uh, four years ago, I started to work on miraculous images with uh, Dorothy Wong from the University of Virginia. Uh, she organized a workshop on miraculous images, Buddhist, Muslim, Christian in 2018, and a panel at the Association for Asian Studies in Washington on sacred miraculous images, um, which was published as a special issue of as Orientalist uh, two years ago. And uh, last year, with, uh, uh, so we co organized uh, with Dorothy Wong an international conference on miraculous images in global perspective in the French Alps. So this was just to inform you of the context of the paper I'm presenting today. Uh, so uh, now I'll uh, present a special and a very well known category of images which has a long story in Asia, the first portrait of the Buddha uh, that played a fundamental role in the diffusion of Buddhism in Asia. Here are some examples from Southern Asia, such as the Emerald Buddha of Thailand or Mahamani of uh, Burma. And the Roti Wong showed that two very distinct types of Udayana Buddha images existed in the Tang period in China, one seated and the other one standing. Uh, we'll see that in the modern period, the Udayana Buddha is a standing Buddha. Uh, these images, uh, Tang Dynasty, were associated with um, uh, als images also called Udayana Buddha, reportedly brought back from India to China by the monk uh, Sanzang. On the right, you see the sandalwood image of the Seriyoti of Kyoto that Japanese claim to be the original sandalwood Buddha which was allegedly exchanged against a copy in the 10th century. And just here, just to honor the Dunhuang Foundation, uh, I show some images from Dunhuang. Uh, the, the three images below are not the first one of the Buddha, but all are considered to be miraculous images. Uh, and art historians, uh, especially focused on and other auspicious images, 
uh, in the medieval times, uh, China, Japan, uh, Korea, or Tibet. So that was <laughs> just uh, images from, from Dunhuang, for the Dunhuang Foundations. Uh, these images are called first portrait because they are believed to be authentic portrait of Buddha Shakyamuni made during his lifetime, and at the same time to be Buddha Shakyamuni in person. Similar stories circulated all over Asia on their very special biography and uh, miracles. And these portraits are said to be self arisen Swayambu in Sanskrit, self-existent, or created through divine intervention made by gods, for instance, uh, Brahma or Maitreya, uh, Buddha Maitreya. Uh, so they are comparable to the Byzantine Akeiropoyeta icons, which means not made by human hands. Uh, this is reflected in their terminology. Uh, for instance, in Chinese, Rui Xiong, uh, auspicious image, Zhen Zhong, true portrait, Ruo Zhen, as you feel. In Tibetan and Mongolian, they are called Ku, Bie, bodies, uh, the same terms used for emanations of Buddhas. Uh, or uh, in Tibetan, Kutsap, uh, meaning representative, substitute, proxy, double of the Buddha. So it's a special uh, category of icons. For devotees, there's no difference between these images and the Buddha himself. The first portraits are thought to possess extraordinary powers, such as ability to move around on their own, levitate, refuse to move, or manifest auspicious signs, uh, emitting supernatural radiance, changing colors, and so on, as well as apotropaic powers they can defend against enemies, and they can also grant worldly benefits, protection from illness, danger, obstacles, and also fulfillment of wishes. But the biggest benefits are soteriological benefits. Some of them have the power to liberate upon seeing or liberate through seeing, tonjol in Tibetan, uh, meaning that they can provoke immediate enlightenment. So these special images are privileged, direct, and tangible access to the original Buddha. And they were used as palladia to legitimate a ruling dynasty and protect kingdoms and empires. They have a biography of a more than 2000 years, even if we should rather speak of reincarnation of the images because they were replaced many times, including in the 20th century. The great German historian Hans Belting in his book on the true image studies the Holy Shroud, the Christian Holy Shroud, which disappeared and reappeared several times and concluded that such a sacred object cannot vanish. And the notion of authenticity is irrelevant for devotees. And here I draw on recent works on the agency and efficacy of what scholars call living images or true portraits. Um, for Buddhism, uh, most of this, these studies focus on medieval Japan, China, and Tibet, uh, as you can see uh, on this slide. Um, now I'll focus on the Mongols who first converted to Tibetan Buddhism in the 13th century and massively in the late 16th century. But they also received transmissions from China and Central Asia, not only from Tibetan Buddhism. The Mongols discovered the similarities of the stories of the Tibetan and Chinese first images of the Buddha. Uh, so this paper is also part of a, of a larger study on the translation uh, in both meanings of the term in English, the translation of Indian art and architecture to Mongolia. Uh, and I have uh, several published several papers on architecture, such as the translation of uh, the Mahabodhi of Bodhgaya, or the Bodhnath Stupa of Nepal uh, to Mongolia. Uh, in the first part, I will present the Mongol cult of the first portraits uh, of Beijing and Lhasa in Tibet and the role of guidebooks. Uh, and uh, then I will show examples of copies of the first portraits uh, in Mongolia and the legends that uh, auth authenticate them. In the third part, I will highlight the Mongols' interpretations of their iconography by questioning the nature of Mongol copies. Uh, could an authentic image be copied through and retain the same power of the, as the original? So this is the question about the copies and the and the prime icon. I will also highlight the role of painted and printed images in propagating the narratives and iconographies of the first portraits from, from Tibet and China to Mongolia. 
Um, if you visit Mongolia, you'll certainly travel to their oldest and holiest monastery known as uh, Erdanju, uh, which has been built on the ruins of uh, the ancient medieval capital Karakorum. Uh, and probably your guide uh, will wrongly translate Erdanju as precious monastery. The term Ju in Mongolian now commonly designates a monastery. But what did it originally mean? Ju or Jo actually transcribes Tibetan Jowo, which means Lord, and originally refers to two statues in Lhasa in Tibet. The first one is the Jowo Rinpoche, now in the Jokhang Temple. It's a portrait of Shakyamuni Buddha at 12. It is said to have been made during his lifetime. And according to uh, 11th century Tibetan accounts, it was offered by an Indian king to a Chinese emperor and later brought by the Chinese princess Wen Cheng to Tibetan emperor Song Sengampo in the seventh century as a dowry when she married Song Sengampo. Um, Ju, uh, this Jowo Rinpoche, Rinpoche means precious in Tibetan. It's a term of respect used for reincarnations or reincarnated lamas, for accomplished masters and for some statues of the Buddha. The second one is the Jowo Akshobya or Mikyo Dorje representing Shakyamuni at the age of eight. And it was brought by uh, Song Sengampo's other wife uh, from Nepal. So the, the Tibetans and later the Mongols used to go on pilgrimage to Lhasa to worship these two images that had the power of liberate through seeing. The Mongols also called Ju, another Buddha statue, the Zandan Ju or Sandalwood Buddha, also known as the Udayana Buddha, which is said to be a lifelike portrait of Shakyamuni carved in sandalwood on the order of King Udayana of Koshambi in ancient India. The Buddha had, at that time had ascended to heaven to preach the Dharma to his mother and the king commissioned this image to make the absent Buddha present. Uh, this uh, very famous statue that I, was, uh, I, I showed before is said to have been transported or transported itself from India to China at the beginning of the first millennium following the propagation of the faith. The statue was transmitted or stolen from one dynasty to another. Uh, and perhaps this, uh, his modern story is less known that, uh, than the, the, the first millennium story. It arrived in Beijing in 1163, where it remained until 1900. From the Tsing Manchu's perspective, this icon contributed to establish the Tsing as a legitimate dynasty and protected the empire. Uh, so I, I use the term palladium, it's like the statue of Pallas in ancient Greece that ensured the safety of the city of Troy, a palladium. The statue disappeared from Beijing during the Boxer Rebellion in 1990. Uh, which was uh, in 1900, sorry, which was interpreted as a sign of loss of the mandate of heaven and thus the end of the dynasty. Uh, so we have no photo, uh, no photo has been preserved of this statue and it is known to us through drawings, paintings, stone inscriptions, and through many copies. Interestingly, the Joel Rinpoche of Lhasa and the Sandalwood Buddha of Beijing share a common Genesis myth. Both were commissioned by an Indian king and carved in front of the Buddha. In the Tang period, the Zhou and the Sandalwood Buddha were both enshrined at the Chinese capital, Chang'an, and the legend may have confused the two statues. So in green, you see uh, the travels of the Zhou Rinpoche, uh, first uh, fr from India to Chang'an and then to Lhasa. In blue, uh, the Nepalese uh, Akshobhya Zhou. And in red, the many travels of uh, the Sandalwood Buddha, Udayana Buddha, uh, from uh, India to Central Asia and China, uh, to Beijing. The Sandalwood Buddha and the Zhou Rinpoche were icons of political religious significance for Chinese, Tibetan, Mongol, and Manchu rulers. Political rituals were performed in front of them. Uh, here are a few examples, but there are many. Uh, the Tsing Manchu emperors in the modern period organized audiences between high ranking reincarnations, uh, such as the Mongol first and second Jackson Damba Hutuktu, or the sixth Panchen Lama, in front of the Sandalwood Buddha of Beijing. Uh, 
and the Dalai Lamas were enthroned and took monastic vows in front of the Jo Rinpoche of Lhasa. Uh, both Jowos of Lhasa and Beijing became so central to Mughal Buddhist faith that they were praised in popular prayers and songs, and even in shamanic songs. Uh, here is an example of a shamanic prayer that uh, from Inner Mongolia that starts with prostrations, circumambulations, and offerings of incense to Joro Rinpoche and to the sandalwood Joro. Uh, I quote, save me Erden Jo, save me Zandan Jo. Uh, and uh, the second one is, in the, is a marriage, uh, marriage song from Hohot, let me pray before my sandalwood Buddha. So it was very, it permeated Mongolian culture. The, the cult of this uh, Jowo was, uh, has become very important for the Mongols of the 18th and 19th century. Uh, the Mongols used to go on pilgrimage to Beijing and Lhasa to worship these true icons. In the 13th century, uh, the emperor Kublai Khan in Beijing, who founded the capital of Beijing, had the Sandalwood Buddha enshrined in the main Tibetan monastery of Beijing, the White Pagoda Monastery. Uh, and um, its story was, the story of the Sandalwood Buddha was translated from Chinese into Uyghur, and then from Uyghur into Tibetan uh, during the Yuan dynasty. And the same story is found in several Tibetan chronicles, such as the Red Annas, the clear mirror of royal genealogy, and in Mongolian chronicles after the 13th century, such as Sagong Sechen's precious summary. It has also been included in the Tibetan and Mongolian version of the Tanjo, the commentaries of the Buddhist canons uh, printed in Beijing in the 18th century. Uh, so here you have a very long list <laughs> of uh, <laughs> not exhaustive of uh, publications uh, mentioning the story of the Sandalwood Buddha in different languages included prayers and poems. The first representations of the Sandalwood Buddha in Tibet came from China with the Ming patronage of Tibetan Buddhism uh, under the Yongle Emperor in the 15th century. They were copied in Tonkas, uh, but in Tibet, the Sandalwood Buddha was much less popular than, uh, than in Mongolia. In the late uh, 17th and 18th century, the great reincarnated lamas from Amdo uh, who resided in, the, in Beijing in the Qing period, um, played a very important role in the propagation of these narratives in Mongolia. Uh, these reincarnated lamas uh, were uh, Tibetans or Mongol, uh, which is an ethnicity very close to, uh, to Mongols, uh, and they were uh, very fluent in Tibetan, in Mongolian, and in Chinese, so they could bridge uh, the different uh, Buddhist cultures. Uh, for instance, the second Shankar Kutuktu uh, in Beijing wrote a text on the Sandalwood Buddha in which he made the link between the Beijing image and the two Jowos of Lhasa and acknowledged that the three of them were authentic portraits. And uh, in 1770, his reincarnation, the very famous uh, third Shankar Kutuktu, Rolpe Dorje. Rolpe Dorje uh, was the Buddhist teacher of Emperor Tianlong. Uh, Rappe Dorje wrote a pilgrimage guide on the history of the Sandalwood Buddha uh, using mostly Chinese sources. Uh, so a guide, it's a guidebook um, in Tibetan Neshe or Kashak to explain pilgrims how to worship the image and all the answering benefits. Uh, this book uh, printed in Beijing, uh, you have a, a photo here, was translated into Mongolia on the following year and had a very wide and rapid diffusion in Mongolia. Uh, we have a dozen xylographed and manuscript versions uh, preserved in different libraries uh, all over the world. And it was reprinted in Boryatia in the late 19th century. Uh, so the story is uh, therefore well known to Chinese and Tibetan Buddhists uh, of late imperial times. And here is a tonka depicting uh, the uh, third Jangya Hutuku Rolpe Dorje. And on the left, you see an image of the Sandalwood Buddha. In the 18th and uh, 19th century, the Mongols undertook pilgrimages to Beijing to worship the Sandalwood Buddha. Uh, so it was first uh, housed in this uh, uh, white pagoda monastery, the, um, 13th century, uh, 
uh, but later it was asked, uh, enshrined in the Forbidden City or in other monasteries. And in the 17th century, in 1665, uh, it was uh, enshrined in the Jantan Monastery, Jantan meaning sandal in Chinese, the Jantan Monastery in the northwest corner of the imperial city. Uh, so it's a monastery founded by the Kongxi Emperor and staffed by uh, with Tibetan monks from Gandan in the Tibet, Gandan Monastery. And the Jantan Monastery was the main monastery, uh, Tibetan Buddhist monastery of Beijing before the foundation of uh, Yonghegung in the 18th century. Um, in the last part of his guidebook, uh, the Changya Hutuktu Rol Pedoche explains how to worship the Sandalwood Buddha through offerings, prostrations, prayers, and circumambulations. Uh, Rol Pedoche lists the miraculous properties of the image and details uh, all the subsequent incommensural benefits that stem from them. Uh, for instance, if one who suffers from serious diseases or torments prays, with his whole heart and sees in a dream the light of the true body, it means sees the statue, he will be cured. As for the number of circumambulations, Rolpe Dorje advises to make several thousand circumambulations uh, around uh, the temple and the statue, the number depending whether they were made inside the temple or, or uh, in the courtyard, including the stupa or outside of the monastery. Uh, so um, on the on the slide you see a, a map of Jantan Se and Jantan Monastery, um, which is a Tibetan style uh, monastery within the urban uh, city in the city of Beijing. Uh, so the pilgrims were um, advised to make uh, three uh, circumambulations, uh, three types of circumambulations, with, which we call the three concentric circumambulations around the Zhou Rinpoche of Lhasa. Um, but the problem is that the Jantan Monastery of Beijing only opened its doors for the New Year festivals and a few festival days. Uh, so those who wanted to worship the icon outside festival days uh, could ask for a special authorization for the emperor, but uh, uh, it was fine for the, the, the high reincarnations, but not for the commoners, for the common pilgrims. Uh, so the common pilgrims could not enter the monastery and could not see the statue. They had to content themselves with circumambulations around the precinct. Uh, the problem is that modern Buddhists do not circumambulate their temples and the narrow streets of Beijing are not adapted uh, to this practice. So th this, must, this very small streets uh, may have been very crowded. Um, the Yuan Mongols in the 13th century also worshiped the Lhasa Jowos. But it is especially after the Mongols reconverted to Buddhism in the late 16th, uh, 16th century that Mongols went on pilgrimage to Lhasa. Uh, the Mongol Buddhists uh, traveled over uh, three, four, or 5,000 kilometers because uh, some Mongols are living in, in Russia and the Volga River. Uh, so they traveled very often on, on foot uh, to worship both the Jowos and, of course, the Dalai Lama of Lhasa. And like the Tibetans, they perform the three concentric circumambulations inside the Jokan temple uh, in a special corridor around the statue, and a second circumambulation around the temple, and a third one around the city. Uh, the pilgrimage of Mongols to Lhasa are well documented in the late 19th and early 20th century uh, because we have wonderful travelogues written by Buryat and um, Kalmyk uh, Buddhist uh, monks and spies, actually. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the well-known uh, book that has re recently been translated uh, into English by Gombojab Tsivikov, uh, who traveled in 1899-1902 uh, to Lhasa. And there's also uh, Agban Dorjev and many others. Uh, Tsivikov, uh, for instance, traveled in the guise of a monk in a group of Buryat and Kalmyk pilgrims. And he gives uh, abundant details of the various gestures, offerings, and prices charged uh, to the pilgrims inside the, the Jokong. So there was a huge uh, business, uh, of course, uh, in the Jokong um, in front of the, of the Jowo. But the Mongols also wanted to have their own copies of the Jowo, their own Jowo. And in the late 16th and 17th century, 
when the princes converted to Buddhism, they made copies of the drawers of Lhasa and the first uh, Mongol temples of that period were built to enshrine a jaw. Uh, these first temples were called Erdenju Shigemuni or just Erdenju, uh, which actually doesn't mean precious uh, monastery, <laughs> but uh, which uh, translates Jowo Rinpoche. Uh, Erden in Mongolia uh, means a jewel uh, and is a translation of Rinpoche. But later, by metonymy, the term Ju, Jowo, came to mean a temple enshrining a precious statue, a monastery, and also a holy city such as Hohot and Lhasa. Lhasa was known in Mongolia as Western Ju, Western Jowo. The Mongol king Altan Khan, a descendant of Genghis Khan, uh, replicated the Jowo Rinpoche and the Jowo Akshobia of Lhasa to turn his new city, Hohot, as a second Lhasa. Uh, Hohot is uh, now the capital city of uh, Inner Mongolia, the Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region of China. And uh, the copy of uh, Jowo Rinpoche has been preserved up to now in the Ichjo Monastery. Uh, you can see uh, the photo here. Uh, and the cost of the statue um, uh, was up to uh, 40,000 tells, uh, tell of silver, which is a huge amount at that time. Um, and uh, his uh, other um, Mongol princes uh, also wanted their own jowos and made copies of the jowo of Lhasa or copies of the jo of this jowo uh, of Hohot. Um, the, uh, and the, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, political, political religious rituals were also uh, performed in front of them, such as the monastic vows of the fourth Dalai Lama who was born in Hohot. So these uh, images were also very uh, important for the legitimacy of the uh, Mongolian kings at that time. Uh, Altan Khan's cousin, Aftai Khan, Abatai Khan, another descendant of Genghis Khan in Northern Mongolia, half Mongolia, also made a copy of the Jowo Rinpoche for his monastery, uh, which also bears the name of Erdenju in North Mongolia. So it, this is the monastery I showed at the, at the beginning. Uh, the statue had a ruby on its head and enshrined a relic of Buddha Shakyamuni, which was offered by the Dalai Lama to Abatai Khan. And this monastery was known as the Bodhgaya of the Mongols, the second Lhasa. The pilgrims to Erdenju Monastery make, used to make and still make uh, three circumambulations. Uh, the first one in a specific corridor of circumambulation around the statue that you can see on the right. Uh, the second one around the temple uh, and the third one around the fortified wall. So it was like the three, uh, three circumambulations around the Jowo Rinpoche of Lhasa. Uh, so this monastery, Erdenju, which has been preserved, this temple has been preserved, is a very rare example of temple with an inner corridor for circumambulation. These corridors were uh, quite common in, Mon Mongolian, in, sorry, in Tibetan monasteries up to the 13th or 14th century, and then um, were not reproduced uh, in uh, monasteries of Tibet and Mongolia. Uh, this, uh, here you see a statue of the Jowo Rinpoche of uh, Erdenju, uh, which uh, unfortunately has uh, disappeared and has been uh, replaced during the uh, 20th century. The same monastery also preserved a very uh, precious uh, sandalwood Buddha image, uh, which is said to have been brought from India, but by the same king, Abatai Khan. Probably there's a confusion in the legends between the two statues. And the king Abadai Khan never went to India or Tibet. But never mind, this is a local legend. Uh, the statue is, was obtained thanks to a subterfuge, and it has a pearl on its forehead which shines like a lamp. This is an important detail. Uh, according to the legend, on his way back to his homeland, Abadai Khan had to stop and put the statue on a peak. But when he came back to pick up the statue, he could not move it. Therefore, uh, he drew his sword and slashed the Buddha in half and carried away the upper half and left away the, uh, the lower half. Uh, when he reached his country, he built a temple for the statue for, for which he made a new wooden under half. When the monastery was attacked by the Western Mongols uh, in the 18th century, 
uh, the robbers stole all the treasures but could not move the small statue and it is credited of many other miraculous feats. These tales thus claims that the statue is a genuine Indian icon obtained by cunning and forced to go to Mongolia against its will. Uh, so this is very peculiar. We, we have many other stories of statues that refuse to move in Buddhist lore and in Mongolian Buddhist lore, but these stories generally end with the construction of a temple on the, stop, uh, on the spot. Uh, but here the Mongol king beheaded the statue and showed that the Buddhist law was subordinate to the king's rule. Um, in Mongolia, other statues are said to be first portraits of the Buddha and were miraculously discovered buried in the Mongol soil and showed uh, many extraordinary pro properties such as emitting light. Uh, so now let's turn to the question of copy. Uh, art historians uh, usually call these statues copies or replicas, uh, but as remarked uh, Bernard Faure, about uh, Japanese images and against Walter Benjamin's theory, it appears that the process of reproduction does not systematically reduce the power of images because some of these copies became equivalent to the originals and other copies claim to be originals. But how could a copy gain efficacy and be considered as equivalent to the drawers of Lhasa and Beijing? First, uh, Tibetan and Mongolian terminology does not make a difference between the Jawas of Beijing and Lhasa and the Jowo, the Jew, uh, of Mongolia. They are all called Jowo and they are all called Biye in Mongolian body. According to specialists of Japanese images, such as Donald McCallum, a copy can gain efficacy, even equivalence with its uh, model, um, under several conditions. First, if it is authenticated by written accounts, such as a pilgrimage book that attests the equivalence between the two, and we have several pil pilgrimage books which were made for uh, Mongolian copies. Uh, for instance, in the biography of Altan Khan in the 16th century, late 16th century, it is said that the Dalai Lama who consecrated the Jowo Shakyamuni of Hohot said it was not different from the Lhasa icon made by God Brahma. So this is an example of authentication. Another, another example is a 19th century pilgrimage guide to the Jowo Shakyamuni of Ordos in Inner Mongolia. Excuse me, can you, can you see my screen? It's fine? Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, because there were, there were other copies made in the early 17th century Mongolia. Uh, so I was uh, quoting this 19th century pilgrimage guide to a Jowo Shakyamuni of Ordos in Inner Mongolia uh, called the history of the Ichchu, Ichchu meaning great uh, Jowo, big Jowo. And this guide explains that worshiping this particular Jowo was equivalent to worshiping the Jowo of Lhasa. Pilgrims should make no difference between them. Uh, I quote, whoever catches a glimpse of the Jowo Shakyamuni of Ordos hears it or remembers it will purify sins and obstacles. So like the Jowo, the Jowo Rinpoche of the Jokong. Uh, so there are other conditions uh, uh, for a copy to gain uh, the same uh, efficacy sorry, as, the, as the model. For instance, uh, of course, uh, copies that work miracles are easily recognized as uh, true images, true icons. And another condition is the accuracy of the copy. Uh, this is stressed, especially by McCallum for Japanese uh, copies and by Cameron Warner, uh, who wrote his PhD thesis about the Jowo of Lhasa in 2008. Uh, so according to the text, likeness to the original is important in the making of a Jowo. Uh, but to which, uh, sorry, but what is the degree of verisimilitude? of likeness in the copies and what exactly must be replicated. Uh, so drawing on uh, McCallum, uh, McCallum's work on, uh, uh, he worked on he has several articles in a book on the uh, Denkoji uh, triad and the Udayana Buddha in Japan. Uh, we can make a distinction between faithful copies destined to be the main image of a temple 
and secondary objects of worship, uh, for instance, smaller statues, paintings, rubbings, and so on, because not all copies can become a true image. Uh, generally speaking, uh, in Mongolia, two dimensional images are merely considered as mere representations, even if they were consecrated. They are not on the same level as uh, three dimensional images uh, because uh, statues have a physical presence that two dimensional images don't have. And as you can see, there are also chains of copies with copies of copies uh, and also prime images that were destroyed or lost and replaced by replicas or copies. Uh, these statues are very difficult to study because uh, many have disappeared and uh, the statues that have been preserved uh, still function as the main icon of their temple. So they are periodically restored, gilded anew, adorned with new clothes, and they are quite difficult to, uh, to see. Uh, just a small clarification, uh, Jowo is not uh, an iconographic type uh, of Buddhas. It is not defined uh, in economic, econometric treaties and in published pantheon. So technically speaking, it's not an iconography. So what are uh, the characteristics first of the Lhasa and uh, Beijing Jowos? I will compare the Jowo Rinpoche of Lhasa, which is more important than the, the other Jowo, the Akchobia Jowo, and the Beijing Sandalwood Buddha. In addition to their legend, the statue of Lhasa and Beijing have two common characteristics. First, they contain precious relics of Shakyamuni. Uh, so they have ontologically the same statue as uh, the same nature uh, as relics. And the relics uh, are supposed to be located in the head and even in the Ushnisha, in the protuberance on top of the head. And the second characteristic, common characteristic, is that they have a jewel on their Ushnisha uh, said to emit light. Uh, and it is said to be a sunstone, a ruby, or another stone. And this jewel is somehow the outer representation of the relics inside the statues. And the statues uh, works like a kind of beacon uh, with emitting light from the jewel on the head. In its present state, the Jowo Rinpoche of Lhasa dates back to the 18th century, but has been partially destroyed by the Chinese and heavily restored. Uh, so on the left, you see a photograph that shows its state before Chinese interventions. And Cameron, Wa Cameron uh, Warner uh, wrote that the photograph is now viewed as more genuine than the modern restored statue. Uh, the Joe Rinpoche is sitting in the lotus posture, like the Vajrasana Buddha of Bodh Gaya, and makes the earth touching gesture. Uh, it is made of a particular metal alloy and precious stones call called called uh, uh, Jikim, the, the, the name of the alloy, uh, and it was gilded. So here it is photographed naked uh, because every year his clothes is changed uh, during the ceremony. Uh, originally, the Jowo was depicted as a monk in his emanation body, Nyumanakaya, so the form, the physical incarnation of Buddha. Uh, but in 1409, the great reformer Tsongkhapa, the founder of the Gelugpa school of Buddhism in Tibet, uh, decided to add a crown, earrings, and necklace to the statue. Uh, this was very controversial because the crown was said to block the, the light emanating from the Ushnisha. And uh, we can't see uh, the jewel and the Ushnisha anymore. You see the very big crown of the Buddha. So the crown and jewels made it change category. It is now represented in his complete enjoyment body, Sambhogakaya. So it's the category of Adorn Buddha. And here I quote uh, the, the, the work of Paul Mus, uh, Buddha Paré uh, in French. Uh, over his robe, the Buddha also wears a celestial garment uh, offered by the gods. As for Mongol copies, uh, on the uh, bottom left, you see the Jowa of Hohot. This is the most faithful copy that has been preserved in Mongolia. It is said to be made of silver, gold, and jewels, and is approximately the same size as uh, the Jorurin Poche of Lhasa. Uh, the mandala and the throne decorated with dragons were also reproduced. Um, the copy of Erdenju in Khalkh Mongolia has disappeared, uh, 
uh, but uh, a famous uh, monk uh, of the early 20th century, Mongolian monk, Zawad Amdin, was very disappointed uh, by the great difference between the image and its model. He visited uh, Erdenzhu and also uh, the Zhou uh, uh, Buddha of Hohot uh, and saw that they were very different. Um, on the uh, painting here, you see uh, the celestial garment uh, offered by the gods, uh, which is also one of the characteristics of this uh, type of Buddha. Uh, there were many other Zhou statues in Mongolia, but most of them were destroyed with the terrible repression of Buddhism in communist Mongolia and Russia in the late 1930s and during the Cultural Revolution in China. Uh, as for the Jowos of Tibet, uh, they were studied by uh, Cameron Warner in his PhD thesis, uh, and he counted about uh, 97 uh, uh, Jowos. Uh, now the Sandalwood Buddha. Uh, it was a human-sized standing statue allegedly made of sandalwood, which is a very precious wood from South Asia, uh, which does not grow in Mongolia. So here on the left is a copy, of course. Originally, he had no crown or jewel and was dressed as a monk. He made the fear a dispelling gesture uh, with his right hand and the gesture of offering with the left. And his body was covered by drapery fold, uh, folds forming U-shaped motifs. The lower part of the garment hung down each leg uh, separately in folds as if the garment is, was wet. So there's a legend in uh, Rolpe Dorje's guidebook that explains that the Buddha was too radiant to be looked at and had to stand in a river so that artists could look at his reflection in the water. This uh, style has been related to Indian Mathura, Ajanta, Gandhara, Khotan, or the Northern Way uh, in uh, uh, six, uh, fifth century China. And here on the left, you see a painting made to replace the statue lost uh, in 1900. Uh, in the middle, the rubbing of a stele, and on the right, a print on cloth. And you see the hair that was styled in uh, what is called a rosette, like a small disc in front, uh, and also the jewel on the ushnisha. Another particularity of this statue is that its eyes looked upwards because the statue looked at the Buddha descending from heaven, uh, where he was preaching uh, the Dharma to his mother. So it is said the statue rose up in the sky and bowed to Shakyamuni as to welcome him. And when they met, the Buddha praised its likeness and prophesied that a thousand years after he has attained Nirvana, the sandalwood image will be his representative on earth and preach uh, the Dharma in China. And of course, it's a mural from uh, Don Huang. Uh, hundreds of copies of the sandalwood Buddha were made in Mongolia and much less in Tibet, apparently. And most of them uh, are small sized statues uh, made in metal. Um, and in Mongolia, we have much more copies of the small copies of the Sandalwood Buddha than of, of the Lhasa Jowos. In museums of Mongolia, of China and Western countries, uh, these uh, Sandalwood Buddha images are very often uh, misidentified as Dipankara Buddha, Shakyamuni, or uh, Maitreya. And uh, Zandanju, uh, sandalwood Buddha in Mongolian, is often distorted and understood as Gandanju, Gandan meaning uh, the Tushita heaven. So the, the identification with Maitreya uh, can stem from the standing posture, uh, but also the fact that both Shakyamuni and Maitreya uh, reside or have uh, resided in Tushita heaven. And uh, it might be that there was uh, a first misidentification uh, in a museum that was repeated by subsequent uh, catalogues. Uh, but many scholars and monks have forgotten the link between these copies and the statue of Beijing. Uh, and uh, I myself told the curator of the Musée uh, Guimet Museum, uh, Guimet Museum in Paris that the statue uh, in Paris that you can see on the right was misidentified but the label has not been changed. <laughs> um, and uh, on the lower left, you see the identification by the, the very famous catalog of Buddhist bronze, uh, Indo-Tibetan bronzes by Ulrich von Schroeder, who identified this uh, same statue as uh, Dipankara. Uh, 
Um, these Mongolian poppies have the Indian style robe and the mudras of the Beijing image. Uh, and they are scattered in many uh, museums all over the world, uh, including in uh, St. Petersburg. And some of them reproduce the upward look. However, they rarely respect the exact size and most of them are in bronze. Uh, so they are quite different uh, from uh, the so-called original uh, Buddha, sandalwood Buddha of Beijing. Uh, this is why I, I don't use the term uh, replica because replica means exact copies. I prefer the term uh, copy. Uh, very few uh, of uh, those I could examine uh, had the jewel adorning the Ushnisha and the rosette. Uh, but of course, the crown, they are all crowned, and uh, the, the Ushnisha and the rosette are, uh, might be hidden under the crown. Um, but uh, remember that the story of the Sandalwood Buddha of Erdenju, I told before, had the pearl on the forehead uh, said to emit uh, light. So, therefore, the material, size, color, style are not necessary uh, to make a true copy. And this also explains why this type has often be, been uh, misidentified. Um, you see that another main difference is that all the Mongol copies have the crown uh, and very often necklaces and jewels of the adorned Buddhas. So I made the hypothesis that a crown, necklace, and jewels were added to sandalwood Buddhas to make them resemble the jewels of Lhasa. There was a transfer of uh, of this uh, 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 crown, necklace, and jewels to the Sandalwood Buddha, because all of them were considered as Jowo on an equal footing. Uh, so who's responsible for this? It might be the Mongols or the great Tibetan and Mongol Lamas of Beijing who decided to crown the Sandalwood Buddhas. Um, as for China, uh, in the Ming and uh, Qing dynasty, in the Ming Dynasty, the, the copies uh, do not have uh, crowns and jewels, but some uh, Qing copies were adorned. Uh, here you see uh, Qing Dynasty sandalwood Buddhas in Beijing and Chengde, uh, Jehol, that have a crown and jewels, um, as well as a painting in the uh, Yonghegong uh, Monastery, the main Tibetan monastery of Beijing in the Qing period. Uh, and it is also possible that the crown uh, may or diadem may have been added to the sandalwood Buddha of the Jantan uh, Monastery of Beijing, uh, because here you see uh, the um, uh, very famous chronicle by Manchu official Lin Xing, who represents the sandalwood Buddha inside his temple uh, with a crown, uh, but with no necklace uh, or jewelry. Um, the iconography of the sandalwood Buddha also borrowed the dragons uh, from the Joro Rinpoche of Lhasa. Therefore, uh, there were probably a transfer of uh, iconography from the Lhasa Joro towards the copies of the sandalwood Buddha uh, in uh, 18th and 19th century Beijing and Mongolia. Here uh, you see a print and a prayer to Shakyamuni from uh, Yonghegong Monastery in Beijing. Uh, this prayer is a kind of digest of Roy Pedorge's guidebook to the statue. And this, this prayer and print is preserved in Buryatia, so in this Russian Republic of Buryatia. And it was very widely diffused and copied in Mongolia. So the Beijing Yonghegong Monastery, which was partly staffed by Mongol monks, was res also responsible for the propagation of the image and its worship in Mongolia, as far as uh, Russian Buryatia. And there are also numerous miniature paintings and prints, uh, very often to be carried in a reliquary or kept at home, such as at the bottom right here, you see uh, an amulet box. And these miniature paintings evidence personal devotion to the specific icon in the Mongol world. Uh, to finish with, I told you that in 1900, during the Boxer Rebellion, the monastery of the Sandalwood Buddha in Beijing was destroyed by the French armies <laughs> as reprisal. Uh, but some records say that the statue was miraculously saved from destruction. It was taken by Buryat monks or Beijing monks to the Wutai Mountains and then to Buryatia. And then it was kept 
in the on, uh, first in the monastery, a guitar monastery, and then during the communist period in the anti-religious museum of Boriatia in Ulanude. Uh, and after the uh, fall of the communist regime uh, in uh, 1991, it was enshrined again in uh, the Egita monastery where it manifested miraculous properties such as levitation. So the Buryats now claim to possess the original statue from Beijing. And they also have a copy uh, currently located in Kijinga Monastery. Uh, the statue has a jewel that is visible on the uh, photograph uh, the, on the right, uh, which was taken in 1935. In the photograph of, uh, of the, you see that he, he had, sorry, uh, on the left um, was taken uh, probably just after uh, a, the a statue arrived in Buryatia. Uh, but unfortunately, the Ushnisha was broken by a thief and the ruby was stolen and the relics have disappeared. Um, there's a monograph by Russian Buddhist scholar uh, Terentiev, Andrei Terentiev, um, in which he argues that this Buddha is the original icon from Beijing, and he highlights northern way characteristics of the image, such as the robe and also the large hands and fingers uh, spread wide. Two expertises of the statue were made by the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, and uh, they concluded that it was dated late 18th century and made of lime wood, not of sandalwood, but covered with a thick layer of sandalwood paste and three layers of gold leaf, uh, gold leaf gilding separated by layers of lacquer. Uh, so they, the, the devotees again um, uh, added uh, new layers to the statue. Its height is um, two meters, 2.18 meters. Uh, we, while according to texts, the Sandalwood Buddha is a life-size image of about uh, 1.60 meters. Uh, but we have a Ming copy uh, in the Forbidden City, in the Fan Hualu, which is 2.10 meters. Um, so this would make uh, a small difference with uh, so-called original icons if it has ever existed. Uh, the image, uh, you see the, the upward uh, look of the, of the image. So one, uh, one hypothesis is that it is uh, 18th century copy made at the Tsing Court. Um, in both Mongolia and Inner Mongolia, statues of Jawas continue to be made uh, in the 21st century. And on the left, the statue is located in the Hohot Monastery, but was modeled directly after the Jawa of Lhasa, uh, and not the nearby uh, Jowo of the Ichto of Hohot. And I finish with this uh, modern image from a Mongol monastery that merges characteristics of the Tibetan and Beijing Jowos. In conclusion, my paper illustrates how the Mongols engaged with Buddhism, appropriated and reinterpreted all stories and icons. Uh, because the Mongols received Buddhism from both China and Tibet and Central Asia, and they worshiped the Sandalwood Buddha of Beijing in the 13th century, they recognized the identical nature of the Sandalwood Buddha and the Jowos of Lhasa. And they called them by the same term, uh, Ju, Jowo, and mixed their visual characteristics. Therefore, the Mongols contributed to reconciling Tibetan and Chinese traditions of Buddhism and created a consistent iconography of an Indian adorned Jowo. And Rolpe Dorje's guidebook to pilgrims had a tremendous influence and was recently translated into Russian uh, for modern Buryats who worshipped their uh, Buryat image. So you see that many statues of Jowo Buddhas were made of various materials in Mongolia, and uh, some, uh, some of them eventually emancipated from their models to the point that the link between the prime image and the copy was forgotten. Uh, some images were said to be no more copies of a distant image, but original portraits said to have come directly from India and been empowered by direct contact with the Buddha. Uh, legends explain their arrival or miraculous appearance in Mongolia. And this is the case of the Jowo statue of Erben Zhu, which has disappeared uh, and it, which was initially modeled on the Jowo of Hohot. But later accounts and legends say to 
that this image has been made in front of Shakyamuni in ancient India and was rediscovered from a 8th century Uyghur monastery in Mongolia. So the Jowo eventually became a type of Adon Buddha disconnected from the images of Lhasa and Beijing. So these images are direct and tangible access to the original Buddha, and they played a fundamental role in the diffusion of Buddhism all over Asia. And in Mongolia, the evolution of their cult tended toward a discourse on the indigenization of Buddhism, because these Jowos now were directly transmitted from India. Uh, and the Mongols, uh, since the 18th century, and especially 20th century, uh, claimed that their ancestors, the Xiongnu, were already converted to Buddhism in the first century, which means that Mongolia allegedly was a Buddhist country even before China and Tibet. Uh, this is, of course, not uh, confirmed by historical accounts. Um, many of these images, most of these images were destroyed, but the Sandalwood Buddha of Boryatia has become an international pilgrimage site. Uh, and now Tibetans from India make pilgrimages to the Sandalwood Buddha of Buryatia. Uh, and it's paradoxical because Buryatia is the most distant and the last converted uh, country or region of Asia. And Buryatia also boasts of having a miraculous living mummy and uh, self arisen images. So you see that these images became a locus of pilgrimages and even international pilgrimages. And for worshipper, whether a sacred image is the original or one of its reincarnations um, is simply not, not relevant as uh, Hans Peltin uh, explained for the Holy Shroud. That's all, thank you very much. Uh, so now um, I can answer uh, your question and maybe stop the uh, screen sharing. Uh, what do you think? Um, Eric, should I uh, stop the, the screen sharing or? Sure, I think um, you can stop the screen sharing for now. Although if some of the okay. questions uh, refer to the slides, we can always bring those back up. Um, thank you so much for that really wonderful uh, and fascinating lecture. I really enjoyed it um, and learned a lot. Um, let's please open up the discussion to question and answer. So please use the question and answer uh, function of Zoom to type in any uh, questions that you have. And we do have some time to address those. Um, I'll start with a couple that have already been uh, entered into the question and answer uh, chat. Um, we have a question about how, um, uh, where and how Mongol images uh, were preserved. You mentioned uh, their destruction at various points in history. Um, so can you just say a little bit more about how certain images uh, get preserved and where they are now, if they're mostly in museums or still in Mongolia, things like that? Yeah. So very few big images uh, are preserved. I show you the, the image of Hohot, which is an exception. Uh, but the smaller images, uh, some of them were um, uh, hidden by monks just before the repression in Mongolia in the late 1930s. Uh, some of them um, were uh, offered uh, to Russian diplomats. Uh, <laughs> or um, taken uh, by different Russian expeditions in Russia and Boyatia, in, in Mongolia and Boyatia, and are now located in, for instance, in St. Petersburg, so in Kazan. So there are many, many uh, copies in Russia. Uh, and uh, we have a few images in Inner Mongolia, sometimes in, uh, and sorry, in uh, Beijing museums, uh, but uh, very often it's difficult to uh, distinguish if they were made in, in, uh, in China or in uh, Inner Mongolia. And in European museums uh, with, yeah, uh, there are a lot in uh, European and uh, American museums uh, uh, that travel through uh, different uh, ways, uh, expeditions and boat, boat in China, et cetera. Oh, great, thank you. Um, we also have a question uh, about, um, if I'm interpreting correctly, so you mentioned sort of how these images uh, arrive in Beijing and, and Lhasa and then in Mongolia. Um, I think this question is asking if you can speak a little bit more broadly about uh, these traditions of uh, uh, movement of images and copies uh, in China and Japan as well. Uh, this is a very big question. <laughs> uh, because we have the legends, we have the uh, travelogue of Monk uh, Xianzong, of course, uh, we, who himself um, 
visited India and saw uh, the explained that he saw the original sandalwood image and brought back copies uh, to China uh, through Central Asia. <laughs> um, and besides, uh, we have a lot of legends uh, and also a lot of legends of images that miraculously appeared uh, in China, Mongolia, and Japan. As for Japan, uh, in the 10th century, monk uh, Chonen, very famous monk, visited uh, China and uh, he went at the court, I think in Chang'an, uh, maybe not, uh, <laughs> uh, and had a copy made uh, for Japan to bring back uh, to Japan. Uh, but legends say that the two Buddhas were exchanged uh, during the night and the real icon was brought back to Japan and is now located at the uh, Seiyuji of Kyoto. Uh, so we have a, a number of, of myth uh, legends uh, and Cameron, Cameron Warner, who studied the, the Buddha, the Jowo of Lhasa, uh, says that uh, perhaps uh, Princess Wencheng, um, when she married to King uh, Sonsengampo, she carried with her the legend, but not the statue. <laughs> so it, this is very difficult to, <laughs> to have real accounts of the travels of these images, uh, which of course uh, were known through many copies and uh, made again uh, through several reincarnations. Uh, thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, uh, if you're familiar with the, uh, the looks like me images of Padmasambhava uh, in Tibet, um, do you know about that tradition and think there's any connection to the uh, narratives of the sandalwood images or other traditions of copying that you've discussed? Uh, okay, uh, they, there are several um, uh, statues of uh, Padmasambhava in Tibet and also in Mongolia said to be Kutsab, uh, which is this special category of statue, which means liberate through seeing. So it's exactly the same category as the Joro uh, Rinpoche and Achobia Rinpoche of Lhasa. Um, and uh, what was the question again? Uh, oh, if there's a connection with the legend, um, they, they belong to this Kutsab category of miraculous images. Uh, and also Kutsab can be uh, applied to um, images that appear on uh, Sharira relics. Uh, uh, which is an so Kutsab is it's a wider category of very special miraculous images, but their stories are different uh, and different from the Sandalwood Buddha and the and the Joe of mm. And and some of them uh, so, sorry some of them were uh, made by Padmasambhava himself. Uh, this mm. is the case of a statue in a, in Inner Mongolia of Padmasambhava made by himself. Uh, that's actually a good segue to our next question, which asks if. Um, uh, I guess it, it asks if self-arising images could only be made during the Buddha's lifetime. Uh, was there some condition that could only be satisfied when the Buddha was alive that allowed for these images to be produced? Or maybe just more generally, can you speak about the difference between images that arise during the, the Buddha's lifetime uh, and so, self-arising images and some, some other types? Uh, excuse me, I, I, I'm reading uh, also the question because I don't understand exactly. Uh, this is not the question on the story from the reflection of the water, no. Uh, um, no, I think I'm, we're, we're two questions up from okay. there. If you, <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, I'm trying to hear and, and, and listen at the same time. So, uh, ah, yeah, okay. Uh, that a lot of this. Yeah, that's what I was explaining. Um, these images. We, we never we will never know if images of the Buddha were made in front of him or not. This uh, art historians uh, think that this prime image never exists actually. <laughs> uh, and this image exists through legends and several legends conflated and several images con conflated. Um, so, and each legend adds or modified previous legends. Uh, and of course, through translations, in, into uh, Chinese, into Uyghur, into Tibetan, into Mongolian, uh, there, there are some uh, some difference between the legends and the explanations of what are the conditions to reproduce the, the first image of the, of the Buddha. Uh, but um, according to legends, uh, it was made by the divine artisans of the god, Vishwakarma, uh, or by God himself, or by 32 artisans uh, who were to reproduce the 32 lakshanas of the Buddha 
uh, when the Buddha was in heaven or by his main disciples, etc., etc. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I can't enter into all the details. <laughs> Um, that's actually a good a good segue into the question that you were reading, which is about the reflections, which I think is asking about uh, when these legends uh, about these images being created during the Buddha's lifetime start to appear. Do, do we sort of know when the first accounts are and um, uh, what different versions there are at different stages? What is funny is that all these images for the Sandalwood Buddha have um, a uh, foreign characteristic, Indian characteristic. Uh, and especially the folds of the robe um, may refer to Buddhas of Mathura and were reproduced uh, in, uh, in Tang China, in Yunggang, etc. Uh, so you have this very distinct robe, which is interpreted as being a foreign uh, Indian robe. Uh, and it appears that in the chronicle by, uh, in the guidebook by Rol Pedorje, he explains the folds uh, and the, the, the kind of wet robe uh, with the, the the idea of the reflection in the river because uh, Buddha was too shining to be reproduced, but uh, in I think it's in Tang Xuanzong's account and other older legends, uh, you have these stories that the artisans can't look at the Buddha and have to uh, reproduce his shadow. It's the shadow image in a cave uh, because they can't look directly at the Buddha, and you have the same story for the Zhou Rinpoche of Lhasa. Uh, so in the specific case of the reflection in the water, uh, this might be an invention to explain the, the faults uh, of the of the robe. Um, speaking of this question of uh, likeness, uh, we have a, a question about, uh, you know, in, in some uh, sort of metaphysical sense, uh, there are ideas of the Buddha being sort of beyond uh, time and individual identity and things like that. Um, but also there's a great importance placed on the likeness of these images to a physical body that has a certain gender and certain kinds of hair and all of that. Can you uh, sort of explain uh, a little bit about that tension? Uh, well, this is the, the theory of the, the, the three bodies of the Buddha in the Mahayana tradition, the, the Trikaya. Uh, the Buddha has had uh, Shakyamuni Buddha appeared on earth with an earthly body. Uh, and this is this body theoretically, which could be reproduced as, as a statue, an image or a painting. Uh, but of course, uh, his higher body is Dharmakaya. Uh, nobody can apprehend it, can see it. Uh, it's it's too, too, too wide and shining. And, uh, <laughs> so you, you, you can't make an image of the Dharmakaya. Of the Buddha. But this intermediate state, Nimanyamaya Kana, is the crown uh, Buddha. You can add the crown to the Buddha, which makes the, this, the second state. Um, let me see. I'm just, I have to catch up on reading the questions myself here. Um, oh, uh, um, was uh, here's a question: Was the sandalwood Buddha uh, did, this, did the sandalwood Buddha ever play a role in the Terma tradition, uh, the treasure treasure revelation tradition in Tibet, or its statues or copies of statues being discovered or unearthed from anywhere? Yeah, this is a very good question. And uh, well, I'm not a specialist of Tibet. I'm not studying uh, Tibetan images. The Mongols were uh, converted mostly by uh, after the 16th century by the Gelugpa uh, monks, uh, which do not emphasize the Terma tradition. Uh, but there are some exceptions, and there are some what the Mongols called red, which means not yellow, not uh, Gelugpa influences, Nyingmapa, Sakyapa, and Kagyupa influences within uh, Gelugpa monasteries. Uh, and there are there are some stories. Uh, of Buddhas which were discovered in the, in the soil, which were compared to Termas. However, they were not discovered by a Terton. Uh, they were not discovered by a special initiate uh, who had received special transmission and visions in dreams. Uh, and th this uh, very specific concept of Terma and Terton um, it ca cannot, cannot apply uh, to the Mongolian concept, context, sorry. Thank you. Uh, in a different direction, uh, we have a question about uh, relationships to Nepal. So this is a question about the term Swayambhu, uh, sort of self-arisen, which refers to the famous Swayambhu Mahachacha in Nepal, along with many other things in Nepalese Buddhism. Um, and you mentioned, you know, self-arisen images. So can you say anything about any possible relationships to Nepal or how these concepts might differ in different places? Yeah, uh, well, actually Swayambhu is a Sanskrit term. Uh, which has different translation into, into Mongolian and Tibetan. Um, and 
which can apply also uh, to the case of uh, the multiplication of relics, <laughs> relics that appear themselves and multiplicate themselves, and sway on boost values. Um, so the, the Mongolian and, term in, uh, and uh, Tibetan terms uh, are um, self-raised uh, statues, self-appeared statues. It can be a translation of Swayambu, but I'm sorry, I have a small problem with <laughs> big cat. <laughs> He's hungry. <laughs> Speaking of self-erasing. Uh, and, <laughs> and of course, in, in Tibet, you are in Nepal, you have this Swayambu Stupa, probably you refer to Swayambu Stupa. Uh, the Swayambu stupa, uh, but especially the Bodnat stupa, the other big uh, ancient stupa of Nepal, was replicated in Mongolia. Uh, and I, I wrote an article on the topic, on this topic. Um, and the Bodnat stupa was much more important for Mongols than the Swayambu Nat stupa. So there are connections between uh, very ancient connections between Nepal and Tibet and Mongolia. Sorry, uh, starting uh, with. Uh, the very famous uh, medieval sculptor uh, and artisan and monk uh, Anige, Arniko, who was invited at the court of Kubilai Khan uh, and who became a very, very famous uh, monk and artist. Uh, later in the 16th century, uh, the Mongol kings um, invited artisans from Nepal to make uh, the statue of the Jowo and his crown in Hohot. I didn't mention these details, but the relations uh, between Mongols and Nepal's continued. Uh, and there's um, a very interesting mystery of the art of the great uh, Mongolian uh, reincarnation, Janabaza, um, which is very close to Nepal, actually, which has many influences uh, from, from Nepalese artism, from Nepalese art. But uh, I'm going uh, to. Sorry. Go sorry. <laughs> no, please. Um, I'm going to use my you know, prerogative as a host to break in with a couple of my own questions before we run out of time. But uh, everyone, please keep adding your questions to the Q&A. Um, but I just wanted to ask a couple of things uh, you know, of my own interest as well. Um, you, know, you mentioned um, that um, the sort of um, uh, materials uh, uh, were not necessarily, the materials that this, the copies were made out of were not necessarily essential to their authentication, but just the presence of relics. Uh, and the, the shining uh, um, jewel. Um, but uh, I'm wondering about more generally the importance of materials and uh, consecration rituals for images uh, in these traditions where uh, it is important to make images out of certain kinds of materials. Of course, you mentioned gold and silver and sandalwood as being valuable, but there's other things as well. Um, and uh, and uh, rituals to, to, there's many different kinds of rituals to consecrate uh, images when they're created. Um, can you speak at all about sort of how these images compare to, you know, other sort of normally made uh, images in terms of how materials are selected, what rituals might be done to to activate or authenticate them, anything like that? Yeah, about materials, um, the Jowo Rinpoche of the Jokong uh, was said to be made of a very special alloy uh, called Jikim in Tibetan, uh, which is extremely mysterious. Uh, there are many treaties describing the different metals and uh, precious stones entering in the composition of this alloy. And the, at the Tsing uh, court uh, in Beijing, the Tsing emperor desperately tried to replicate this alloy. Uh, and they, they, they could manage a very special bronze, but they couldn't really discover the, the, the special alloy. Uh, as for the Sandalwood Buddha, so it's made from a specific wood which grows in Southeast Asia and South Asia which you can't find in North China and Mongolia. And the term uh, Jantan in Mongolian uh, actually came to designate uh, many, many different kinds of very precious uh, woods uh, that were generally imported, uh, but not only sandal. And uh, we don't have the proof that sandal wood was massively imported from, I don't think so actually, uh, from South Asia uh, to uh, Mongolia, but there were many other precious uh, woods that were imported to Mongolia. So Jantan became a very uh, general category of uh, precious wood. And what's interesting is that um, in Europe, uh, the most miraculous images are made of wood. And some uh, very famous uh, medieval historians, such as Michel Pasteur in France, argues that wood is a living material. And you, you find the same also concept in, in, uh, in Japan, where many statues are made of wood or sometimes it's a, a branch of wood that was discovered with a special shape and, and the, the Buddha appears in, in the shape of, of the wood. So wood is a, if, if actually is a very important material. 
Um, but we, we don't have uh, many information on the many documentation on the on the materials and, and consecrations of the of the jewels of uh, Mongolia. Uh, we know that they were uh, made of very very precious uh, wood. Uh, sorry, uh, metal. Usually metal. M Mongols clearly preferred uh, metal uh, alloys, uh, bronzes or other alloys, and golden gilded etc. Uh, that, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, uh, we have a, another question from the audience, um, which is um, about the stories where images refuse to move and be reloc relocated, which you mentioned an example of. Uh, the question is, uh, you know, if you can guess about what happened historically, uh, we may not have other sources, you know, to say about that. But if I can just expand that a little bit to just um, uh, ask, you know, maybe are, is there any evidence that these stories, th these kinds of things do actually uh, happen in, in historical records or are they sort of political statements that might have been inserted at later times? Like, how do we think about these stories uh, in terms of their historicity in general? Well, this is a universal trope that, that you especially find in, in Catholicism too. <laughs> of many, many instances of uh, Catholic men that refused to move. And in all these uh, cases that are documented, this uh, is uh, to legitimate the creation of a local shrine. And of course, we can imag imagine that th these legends were created to legitimate this shrine, which was already built before the legend. <laughs> um, but the, the let this kind of uh, uh, stories applies to also uh, to the relics of Genghis Khan, to uh, um, to all kinds of, of uh, sacred objects that uh, have their, are believed to have their own agency and, and decide to stop at a specific place. So you have the, those that refuse to move and uh, also in the legend of the Jowo, uh, he decided to stop at the Jokong and refuse to move. Uh, and you have the stories of, um, of statues that move by, the, that choose to move by themselves. Which is the case of the sandalwood Buddha uh, in the first millennium that is believed to have transported itself magically from one place to another. And the image that went from apparently Beijing to Buryatia uh, is said to, uh, to have transported magically to, to Udaishan. So there's many of these legends that, uh, of course, we can imagine uh, in a more positive way of thinking were created after uh, the creation of the shrine. But who knows? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, we do still have time if people would like to add some more questions. Let me ask one more of my own uh, while, while we have a quick pause. Um, you mentioned, uh, at least in Mongolia, that the three-dimensional images are, are understood as sort of more authentic than the two-dimensional images. Um, but also you give some examples of, for, for example, a photograph of an image that had been uh, destroyed actually being more authentic than the, the three-dimensional reconstruction. So I'm wondering, are there any examples of three-dimensional images that are copies of two-dimensional images? And uh, do we see this dynamic operating in different directions uh, according to circumstance? Well, when uh, researchers say something, there are always exceptions, of course. <laughs> uh, the first millennium, indeed, the very ancient stories uh, about these images coming from India to China, uh, there are cases, uh, and it's I think it's the account by Xuanzang uh, of a two-dimensional uh, image. Uh, some say that originally the first portrait of the Buddha was two-dimensional image. Um, the fact is that uh, in in Mongolia there's clearly a preference for uh, three-dimensional images, which clearly have, have more presence. Uh, it's representation. We say also in French, presentification. They are real, like like the body of the Buddha himself. So, um, yeah. Um, but of course, there are there are some exceptions, and one exception, of course, is the the photograph. That I should... um, another question from the audience: Can you say more about the the celestial garment? Uh, sort of where how it gets its shape, uh, the, the the fit, the the the, the, de the details of the different kinds of textile and fringe and things like that. Uh, well, this is a very ancient Buddhist motif that you find on uh, Kashmir uh, images of the, the 10th, about the 10th century. Uh, and it's typically uh, uh, an offering a gift from lay communities, uh, a, garment, a supplementary garment to, to adorn uh, a Buddha that is periodically changed uh, every year during, during ceremonies. 
uh, and um, yeah, it's it's in one piece uh, with a hole uh, for the head. So this is a very ancient garment that you that you can find all over all over all over Tibet and, and Mongolia, and also in Chinese icons. But very often it is not represented, depicted on the image itself. But it's a real garment uh, that is offered by the devotees. Great, thank you. Uh, oh, we we'll just have another question come in. Um, Oh, can you um, think of any examples of similar uh, copies of Buddha images from uh, Sri Lankan or Thai traditions? Yes, but I will give you a bibliography references because it's not <laughs> my specialty. Um, there's an, um, there are some works, especially on the Buddhas of Burma, uh, that were uh, that has uh, a similar role um, in the different Burmese dynasty and the object of uh, that that was used for legitimate uh, new new dynasty and new and new kingdoms uh, and of course you can still uh, look at uh, visit the, the mahamuni in burma and uh, the buddha of thailand uh, the, the jade uh, image of, of thailand was in the imperial the royal palace of, of thailand and the one in sri lanka there's an extensive literature on these uh, south asian statues uh, and Peter Braun, for instance, wrote on the on the Buddha of, of Bangkok, if you're interested. And this, this Buddha has a very uh, specific story. Peter Braun argues that it has a life of its own because it is uh, working miracles that a Buddha is not supposed to do. And for instance, he is able, this Buddha is able to kill people. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> this makes a difference between the real Buddha and, and the actual statue. Uh, and some authors argue that we should say he for the icon, uh, according to emic uh, terminology uh, of Kutsab in, in Tibetan, of uh, Jowo, Ju, because he is a, a body, a living body of the Buddha. Oh, this is really fascinating. Oh, let's see if we have another question. Um, oh, are there, is there ever sort of suspicion or criticisms of the authenticity of these uh, copied images, especially in, in Mongolia? Um, actually, uh, Buddhism, and especially the high clerics, the elites, uh, always had some problems with material culture, as you know. <laughs> There's a literature about this, this question. For instance, uh, Fabio Rambelli wrote a book uh, and the problem of material culture. So it's not only this specific type of Buddha image, but uh, all the images in general uh, are sometimes considered as mere help uh, just for illiterate uh, persons. Uh, but the, the real uh, Buddhist meditants uh, should be able to reach uh, enlightenment with other means, especially the scriptures or. So there's defiance of uh, uh, of Buddhist, yeah, towards material culture in general, and not only on these icons. And there's an extensive literature about about this question, but not on this uh, specific. I've never seen about this this specific uh, first images of the Buddha. Mm. And of course, the, the, there's uh, polemics, uh, many discussions in Russia after the, the rediscovery and the expertise in Saint Petersburg. Is it the real one, etc. Uh, can you elaborate a little more on the meaning of the dragons? Uh, the, I think the, the, referring to the throne. Oh the yeah. Dragons on the, throne? Um, the dragons are um, uh, coiled around the uh, columns of the Jokong Jowo uh, because there's this story that the Jowo tamed the local deities. Uh, that were opposed to the Buddhist conversion of Tibet. Uh, and they, the, yeah, uh, so it's a symbol of the taming of, of the local deities. Mm -hmm. The Lu in, uh, in Tibetan. Mm -hmm. Nagas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that in, in some ways relates to uh, an, another question that we have. If you could just say a little bit more about the kinds of places that miraculous images uh, stop, you know, when they stop miraculously, you mentioned that often that's used to sort of authorize the construction of a temple or something like that. Are, are there other, you know, specific kinds of places or um, what's the difference between stopping at a place that is being created versus stopping at a place that's already famous like Utashan or something like that? Uh, 
Well, this will perhaps be the topic of my next book <laughs> uh, <laughs> on, on sacred places and also the particular list of um, um, places that were worshipped uh, before the introduction of Buddhism and were uh, specifically uh, shamanic places in, in Mongolia. Uh, so, yeah, I won't say more about that because this will be the topic of my, of my next book. <laughs> Well, we'll have to invite you back for another lecture. <laughs> <laughs> um, that may be uh, actually a good place to stop. I think we're just about out of time. Uh, and I want to make sure to, to save the last minute to thank, first of all, our audience for attending today. And for, oh, excuse me, and uh, the, the, the Nagas don't, don't have oh. wings. I, I see a question uh, on, the, on the chat. Why did Nagas get wings? I, I've never seen Nagas with wings. Maybe it's... Uh, <laughs> The dragons don't have wings. <laughs> they fly by their own. <laughs> Sorry. Thank I'm you sorry. for thank you for answering the last question. I was just afraid we were running out of time, but thank you so much for doing that. Um, so that was the last question. Yeah. Um, but uh, first of all, thanks to our audience for uh, attending today and asking all of these wonderful questions. Um, and thanks very much to our speaker, Dr. Charlotte. This was a really wonderful presentation. I learned a lot, and we had a lot of great questions from other people that I'm sure learned a lot as well. So thank you so much. Uh, and hope you ha everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. Thank you very bye. much. Thank you again for inviting me. Bye. Thanks. Bye.